hybrid or lot. So think about it as embracing your uniqueness. When I grew up, my parents had this poster in my room that I use this motto for the rest of my life. In a world full of copycats, be an original. So get as many ideas as you can this week through the symposium, but use them in a way that are original for you and highlighting your strengths and what will work best, best with your students and your population of children that you're working with. Remember, first comes love, then comes mastery. So it's wonderful that we're learning all of these fantastic tips on ways to recruit introduce the instruments, how to teach our ensembles virtually and remotely. However, that means nothing if we're not going to connect to our students as human beings. So before we can even do any of these recruiting activities or try or attempt to teach our students remotely or virtually, we have to love them first. And by doing so, we need to make sure that they understand us as human beings and that we're having challenges during this time of a pandemic and that we have to understand what their needs are for their social and emotional learning. So before you do any teaching with your students, regardless if it's virtual, live, or in whatever form, share your story with them. Let them know who you are what you hope to achieve with your students and your program, what your background is, what the challenge and joys will be in the form of teaching that you're teaching remotely, virtually, hybrid, and so forth. So here's a little example of mine, but I want you to think about how can you create a presentation for your students for back to school? And you can share with this with them virtually, this could be in the classroom on slides, it could be a video, but the point is, before we try to teach our students, let's love them first and let's give them an opportunity to learn who we are and what we have to offer. So for me, it was all in the family with my mom and my dad. Was it in your family? And could you share that with your students as well? I followed in my dad's musical footsteps. Although I didn't want to do so at first, I started in business as a major in business and then transferred into music education. My first teaching experience was in Berks County, Pennsylvania, so you could share that with your students. If this is not your first teaching experience, let them know what was your first teaching experience. Then I moved to Maryland. Didn't want to leave Pennsylvania, but I transferred there to marry my husband had my second teaching experience in a very diverse demographic of students, where you can see where, what the Black and African American population was, the Asian, Hispanic population, and most importantly, the free and reduced lunch. We had 74 nationalities that were represented in this school. And going back to where I had taught in a very rural area, woo this was a wake up call to what richness and diversity there is. And hopefully in this symposium, you're learning about all the diversity in the 32 states that are represented. This was a Title I school. We went into corrective action during my time there. But during the time that we were in corrective action, meaning being taken over by the state, we were also the featured middle school band for the Maryland Music Educators Association. And we received lots of accolades because we united together. And because it was important for me that my students understood what my strengths and limitations were, and I understood what their strengths and limitations were. And so before I was able to teach them music, I taught them about us as humans. And then I was asked to open up another school. But share all of these. These are just examples of what you can share with your students. I went on leave from my school system for the last four years because I wanted to pump the brakes a little bit and spend some time with my children. And that has led to some amazing opportunities, one being here to speak with you, but having the opportunity to travel all across the world to motivate and mentor students. So share with your students at the end of this month and in September what you did this summer. Tell them, let them into your life a little bit. Show them all the ways that you've been learning virtually and remotely. Pre presenting, 
teaching a course through the University of Arts, getting together with colleagues and talking shop. Maybe it's practicing your instrument a little bit more, teaching private lessons online, podcasting. Share all of these things with them. And then share ways that you've been not working with music with your students. So I have a ridiculous colleague who nominated me for the 22 day push up challenge. And so I'm doing that and getting a little bit more acclimated with my health and my nutrition. And my two year old has been serving as my trainer <laughs> during this time. But your students want to see this. They want to know what's going on with you. And they want to know what challenges and joys you've been having during this pandemic. So after you share your story with your students, ask them what their stories are. What challenges are they having? And you'll be surprised what they tell you. It can be in written form. They could share it through the Zoom screen. They could email it to you and so forth. But knowing what your students' stories are, what challenges and joys they have, will really help you in the classroom. Think about all of the cultural diversity that comes with so many different students. That could be their ability levels, their age, their culture, their ethnicity, gender, learning style, and so forth. When I moved from very rural Pennsylvania, I mean, I taught on the Daniel Boone homestead. You can't get much more rural than that. And moved to a very diverse community. That was wonderful. But it gave me an opportunity to learn all of the differences that students have and people have and how we need to highlight this in our teaching, our conducting, our recruiting, how we communicate with our students. Our students need to have mirrors and windows. When we select our teaching activities, when we select our clinicians, our conductors, our composers, and the repertoire that we put in front of them, we want our students to have both mirrors and windows so they can see themselves and see into other cultures reflected in whatever that work is. Are you providing mirrors and windows for your students? Because it'll allow for acceptance, they will feel more welcome. They will feel accepted into your virtual classroom, your live orchestra rehearsal space, your live bedroom. They will feel more developed as musicians, as learners in general, and as citizens within this wonderful nation. And are you uniting your students? Do they feel unified in your classroom? Are you then differentiating your instruction? And we can think about it in four simple learning styles. You might have your visual learners that say, can I see it? I need an example to see. Your auditorial learners who say, can I hear it? Be it someone speaking, being it music played. Those learners who prefer to read and write. And those kinesthetic learners, can I do it? Can I play it? Can I perform it? So here's a quick little spiel on ways that you can introduce musical selections to your students in a live or virtual way. Prelude to performance, that's what I like to call it. How many times have you handed out a piece of music to your students and asked them to sight read it without even talking about the title, pronouncing it correctly, explaining who the composer was, talking about historical information about the piece, maybe sharing a program note, and so forth. I know I can say that very early on in my career, I rarely did any of these things. I was so panicked about getting the music in front of my students and getting them to start learning and playing it that I forgot to make that human connection of who the composer was, what the title of the piece was. All of these things you can do virtually. Some of these things we can do even more virtually through a computer screen. So here's a couple of examples regarding differentiation of instruction. For your students who need to see it, if you have a piece of music that represents a portrait or a landscape or a painting or a place, share it. So my friend Tyler Grant, wonderful composer who wrote for both band and now starting with some orchestra, wrote this piece based on uh, Frederick Edwin Church's piece, Banner of the Sky. 
I actually wrote the program notes for this piece. But it would mean so more to your students if they saw this portrait before they played the music. You can do this virtually. Share your screen. Win of the podium, a piece by a female composer and one who was the first female to integrate um, or to conduct an integrated military band. So for students that like to read, you could put a paragraph up on the screen or you could send them an article of who Virginia Allen is and they can read about her as a, comp a composer, a conductor, a leader before you start to learn her music. Can I write it? So for your students like myself who love to write, Gerard Hall has this awesome piece called Lost Woods Fantasy. If you read the program note here, you can make an activity for your students of where they have to write about how they're trapped inside the woods and how they get out. And that could be a prelude to performance before they learn the piece. Can I hear it? So, at, at this, you could reach out to any composer and ask them if they would like to record a little snippet for you. Everybody that I asked over the last couple of weeks has said yes. So take the time to make a connection with a composer and ask them to record a message for your students. Hi everybody, I'm Adrian Sims, a 20 year old composer located in the Baltimore area. I study music education and composition at the University of Maryland and I also like writing a lot of music for concert bands and orchestras. The piece I want to share with you today called Champions Rising, I wrote last year and is published this year through the FJH Music Company. It tells the story of setbacks and challenges that we face in life, all of us do, and we have to, we somehow have to overcome those. And even if we can't see the end result right now, that to know that our dreams and aspirations, they are truly possible to achieve no matter how big they are, and no matter who says we can or can't achieve them. And this piece is dedicated to my grandmother for being that person to help me see that I can, I am able to achieve anything I want to. And I want to be able to share that with you as well and let you know that anything you want to do, you can achieve. Fellow Rising Champions, go chase your dreams. So reach out to any composer, any leader that you want. Ask them if they will record a little snippet for your students. And think about including some cultural diversity in there. Here's Adrian, a 20 year old at the University of Maryland and what a message he has for his students. And then finally, for your kinesthetic learners, can I do it? And Brian is gonna be coming on here next and he's texting me in the middle of this presentation, Keith, so just wanna let you know. <laughs> um, some self-paced developing, fully adaptable, flexible music, whatever you want to call it. Tons of composers are offering all of this music for our students. So remembering, can I do it as one of your learners? So I challenge you to refresh your imagination. What a wonderful opportunity that you have doing that this week. But I remind you to be prepared. Think about all of the different students that you're serving, all of the challenges that they have and all of the needs that they have. Be positive. We're all in this together. Heck, I'm down the shore with the lights flickering and making this happen and trying to be as positive as possible. You need to be as positive for your students. If they sense the negativity in you, then this virtual instruction or this hybrid teaching will mean nothing. Be positive in everything that you present and be persistent. We don't know how long we're going to be in this situation. Heck, back in March, we thought it was gonna be two weeks. And look, it's August and we're rolling into another school year, being as persistent as we possibly can to give our students the best education in whatever form that is. Do it with pride and passion, but most importantly, embrace your uniqueness while you do it. You have strengths that your colleagues don't possess. And you have limitations that you need to acknowledge. And once we know what our strengths are and can acknowledge those limitations, 
there's an endless world out there for what we can do to make our programs the best and to serve our students in the best way that we can. I'm available for you as a resource. I've uploaded six of my articles to the resource folder for you, but there are 54 others. And so if you go to my website, makingkeychanges.com, and you click on publications, that will scroll down and all of my publications, Teaching Music Magazine, Intune Magazine, NAFME, Program Notes, all the different things are up there. There are also several different interviews and podcasts that are available where I talk about many other different things. So I hope that you are making key changes to refresh your imagination during this time. Please know that I can be one of those resources for you, and I encourage you to reach out in any way possible. Keith, thanks so much for having me. Tom, I miss you so much. Randy, I hope I get to know you better. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. You're awesome. It's really, really thanks, awesome. Keith. Yep. Um, the goosebumps they talked about yesterday, I got them. Got them. <laughs> um, Brian, are you on the call? Maybe. <laughs> oh, Lori, before I forget, somebody put in the chat, could, could we uh, get a copy of your presentation? I was wondering if maybe you could upload a PDF of it or something into your folder. Sure. The, actually, all of the resources that I put up there are a combination of all this and go into more depth. So that probably would be even more helpful, too, if they look at those. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, Brian. Welcome. Uh, Hi. Let me give you a quick introduction. Brian Balmages is an award-winning composer and conductor whose music has been performed throughout the world with commissions ranging from elementary school to professional orchestras. As a conductor, Mr. Balmages enjoys regular engagements with all state and region bands and orchestras, as well as university and professional ensembles throughout the world. Notable guest conducting appearances have included the Midwest Clinic, Western International Band Clinic, uh, College Band Directors Conference, American School Band Directors Association National Conference, and others. Additional conducting appearances have included the Kennedy Center, Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, as well as engagements in Australia, <laughs> Canada, and Italy. Currently, he is Director of Instrumental Publications for the FJH Music Company and Assistant Director of Bands and Orchestras at Towson University. Please give Brian Balmages a warm welcome this morning. Thank you very much. Um, my lights just flickered. How awesome is that? Although I have a generator. So if for some reason I get kicked off, I'll be back in three minutes. Um, so um, first of all, it, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, let me tell you the direction that I really want to go in with this, because I think over the last several weeks, months, we've all been flooded with a lot of great concepts. We've been flooded with a lot of information about the, the type of teachers we need to be, the way we need to prepare, uh, the, the, the overall atmosphere we need to anticipate and how we need to plan. Um, and those are all important things. Where I kind of look at this from right now is as I now virtually travel, but still travel around the, the, the world, what I'm running into is a lot of teachers who all agree that things are possible, but everyone kind of doesn't really know how, right? Yes, we need to have band, how? You know, yes, we need to have orchestra, how? Um, and, and I have teachers that have contacted me and, and great creative ideas. We're going to do a composer research project, right? We want to interview you on a Monday or talk with you briefly on a Monday. Then the kids are going to do a research project throughout the week. And then on Friday, we're all going to uh, do a Q&A with you, you know, and, and, and that's fine. You know, that, those are great ideas. It doesn't get the kid playing. And I just did a piece for for all, I'm sorry. Sorry, on social learning. They're called Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music. Uh, I talk, I'll, I'll pop, find that website uh, and put it into the chat. But in that weird discussion, the whole point of being uh, social emotional teachers 
in music. And, and we've asked ourselves, well, what does that even mean? Um, how do we embed social emotional learning in our music curriculum? And my answer is quite simply, backing music, right? That's exactly what we're doing. So my concern and what I want to talk about is that, number one, music has become, and it always has been, one of those places where kids go to feel comfortable, to feel safe, to feel connected in school. And that's not going to change. As a matter of fact, that is even more paramount now that when kids are in, a, if we want to call it a virtual environment, and by the way, I invite you to change your wording. I hear a lot of talk about distance learning and virtual learning and online school. All of those terms imply separateness. They really do. My son's school has started using the word connected learning because we're not separate. We're not online. We're not virtual and distant. We're trying to bring everybody together. And so they're using connected learning, which I think is beautiful. And I think it's a term that we can all try to embrace, right? I didn't come up with it, but I'm stealing it. And I therefore give you all opportunities to steal it too. So what I want to talk with you about nothing. Be positive in everything that you present and be persistent. We don't know how long we're going to be in this situation. Heck, back in March, we thought it was going to be two weeks. And look, it's August and we're rolling into another school year being as persistent as we possibly can to give our students the best education in whatever form that is. Do it with pride and passion, but most importantly, embrace your uniqueness while you do it. You have strengths that your colleagues don't possess, and you have limitations that you need to acknowledge. And once we know what our strengths are and can acknowledge those limitations, there's an endless world out there for what we can do to make our programs the best and to serve our students in the best way that we can. I'm available for you as a resource. I've uploaded six of my articles to the resource folder for you, but there are 54 others. And so if you go to my website, makingkeychanges.com, and you click on publications, that will scroll down and all of my publications for Teaching Music Magazine, Intune Magazine, NAFME, Program Notes, all the different things are up there. There are also several different interviews and podcasts that are available where I talk about many other different things. So I hope that you are making key changes to refresh your imagination during this time. Please know that I can be one of those resources for you, and I encourage you to reach out in any way possible. Keith, thanks so much for having me. Tom, I miss you so much. Randy, I hope I get to know you better. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. You're awesome. It's thanks, really, Keith. really awesome. Yep. Um, the goosebumps they talked about yesterday, I got them. <laughs> got them. Um, Brian, are you on the call? Maybe. <laughs> oh, Lori, before I forget, somebody put in the chat, could, could we uh, get a copy of your presentation? I was wondering if maybe you could upload a PDF of it or something into your folder. Sure. The, actually, all of the resources that I put up there are a combination of all this and go into more depth. So that probably would be even more helpful, too, if they look at those. Oh. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, Brian. Welcome. Hi. Um, let me give you a quick introduction. Brian Balmages is an award-winning composer and conductor whose music has been performed throughout the world with commissions ranging from elementary school to professional orchestras. As a conductor, Mr. Balmages enjoys regular engagements with all state and region bands and orchestras, as well as university and professional ensembles throughout the world. Notable guest conducting appearances have included the Midwest Clinic, Western International Band Clinic, uh, College Band Directors Conference, American School Band Directors Association National Conference, and others. Additional conducting appearances have included the Kennedy Center, Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, as well as engagements <coughs> in Australia, Canada, and Italy. Currently, he is Director of Instrumental Publications for the FJH Music Company and Assistant Director of Bands and Orchestras at Towson University. Please give Brian Balmages a warm welcome this morning. 
Thank you very much. Um, my lights just flickered. How awesome is that? Although I have a generator. So if for some reason I get kicked off, I'll be back in three minutes. Um, so um, first of all, it, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, let me tell you the direction that I really want to go in with this, because I think over the last several weeks, months, we've all been flooded with a lot of great concepts. We've been flooded with a lot of information about the, the type of teachers we need to be, the way we need to prepare, uh, the, the, the overall atmosphere we need to anticipate and how we need to plan. Um, and those are all important things. Where I kind of look at this from right now is as I now virtually travel, but still travel around the, the, the world, what I'm running into is a lot of teachers who all agree that things are possible, but everyone kind of doesn't really know how, right? Yes, we need to have band, how? You know, yes, we need to have orchestra, how? Um, and, and I have teachers that have contacted me and, and great creative ideas. We're going to do a composer research project, right? We want to interview you on a Monday or talk with you briefly on a Monday. Then the kids are going to do a research project throughout the week. And then on Friday, we're all going to uh, do a Q&A with you, you know, and, and, and that's fine. You know, that, those are great ideas. It doesn't get the kid playing. And I just did a piece for NAFME, um, or Music for All, I'm sorry, on social emotional learning. They're calling it Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music. Um, after my talk, I'll, I'll find that website uh, and put it into the chat. But in that weird discussion, the whole point of being uh, social emotional teachers in music. And, and we've asked ourselves, what, well, what does that even mean? Um, how do we embed social emotional learning in our music curriculum? And my answer is quite simply by making music, right? That's exactly what we're doing. So my concern and what I want to talk about is that number one, music has become, and it always has been, one of those places where kids go to feel comfortable, to feel safe, to feel connected in school. And that's not going to change. As a matter of fact, that is even more paramount now that when kids are in, a, if we wanna call it a virtual environment, and by the way, I invite you to change your wording. I hear a lot of talk about distance learning and virtual learning and online school. All of those terms imply separateness. They really do. Um, my son's school has started using the word connected learning because we're not separate. We're not online. We're not virtual and distant. We're trying to bring everybody together. And so they're using connected learning, which I think is beautiful. And I think it's a term that we can all try to embrace, right? I didn't come up with it, but I'm stealing it. And I therefore give you all opportunities to steal it too. So what I wanna talk with you about is whether you're hybrid, whether you are online, we have ways of connecting with kids and giving them musical opportunities. And at the end of the day, if we are not giving them opportunities to feel like they are part of a rehearsal, if we are not giving them opportunities to feel like they are part of a group, we're going to lose them. An entire semester of research projects, of talking about composers and Believe me, I'd love for people to talk about me, but that's not going to keep them in band. That's not going to keep them in orchestra. And so I want to make sure that we have a good way of connecting. So real quick, I'm just going to scroll through. How many, how many band folks do we have here? Um, you just show of hands. Um, see, there's a lot of you here. And then what about orchestra folks? Orchestra folks, yeah, so I see. And then we have see a lot of crossover folks as well. So what I want to do is give you options, tangible options that you can use with your kids and, and go through a lot of things, okay? So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Hopefully, you're all going to be able to see this. Um, and I want to talk with you about options because, again, everything that we talk about, they're all great philosophical things. But at, we're at a point where you are weeks away, some of you less than weeks away, some folks in the country are already back in school. We need real resources right now. What can you use with your kids? That's the question people want to know. So let's dive in, okay? 
The first thing I want to show you is a book on rhythm. Count me in. This is on smart music for those of you that use smart music. Darcy Vote Williams is a director in Texas. Her bands are phenomenal, but she is a rhythm god. She really is. She has a book called uh, Teaching Rhythm Logically, TRL. It's an online book that you can check out. Uh, and what this is, this is a book for kids that have no instruments. Okay, so if you're teaching beginners and they have no instruments, you have options for them right now, all right? And not only do you have options, but you have more than just options, okay? So here's lesson one. I just wanna go through this with you for a minute. We're learning quarter notes. We are learning a counting system. Now you can adjust the counting system for whatever counting system that you want, but here's where it gets really cool. Look at this. We have ensemble pieces. And kids can use any kind of found sounds that they want to, all right? But they have the opportunity to either do duets by themselves or through some of the various apps using something like um, uh, acapella or uh, some of these other apps that we're starting to see pop up online for kids to be able to rehearse and perform together. So this is a whole series of rhythmic things, whether kids have the instruments or don't have the instruments and it gives them opportunities to go through. And so you'll see half notes and half rest. We teach them ways for sustaining pitches, just some general examples, all right? Um, this goes through, really fun, by the way, and they can do it with pitches that they want to. They don't have to. They can make up their own pitches if they want to, all right? They don't have to. This goes all the way into eighth notes, right? We go into 16th notes. Um, we go into mixed meter, all right? And you'll notice that even with these, they're full page performance pieces for them, all right? So this is a great example for you at any level, really, whether you're beginning your students or whether you're uh, in high school and you want to give them some uh, really important rhythm lessons every week, right? To try to fill in, all right? Now, in addition to this, uh, let me get into uh, the Reimagine initiative. Uh, a lot of you may know, and if you don't know, I'll let you know right now. Uh, I am part of a group called the uh, uh, Creative Repertoire Initiative. And that is a group of composers that came together. Uh, the composers include, in addition to myself, there is uh, Stephen Bryant, uh, Michael Daugherty, uh, John Mackey, Frank DeKelly, Peter Meekin, Jennifer Jolly, Alex Shapiro, Eric Whitaker, um, uh, who else is in there? Lots of, lots of folks, right? Lots of really, really great names. Omar Thomas is in there. Um, and so these folks, what we've done is we've all come together, not to try and dominate the market, but to try to create new templates, new ideas to present repertoire in a way that can be used by people, whether they're in hybrid situations, mixed learning environments, or completely in a virtual. Um, realm. And I'm going to share examples of all of them, but this is what I've come up with. And this is called the Reimagine Initiative. Um, Lori had presented a couple pieces. One of them was Gerard Hall and another one was Adrian Sims. And those particular pieces, I didn't even realize she was going to show those, um, but I'm going to show uh, one of those in an adaptable format. Now, it's important to clarify for all of you, uh, there is a Facebook group called Creative Repertoire Initiative. I, enjoy, I encourage you to join that group. We also have a website, but the group is where it's happening. The creative, it's called Creative Repertoire Initiative. Composers from all over the world are posting adaptable arrangements there daily for band and strings. The focus of CRI was band, but a lot of you in the string world know that I love strings and I love writing for strings. And, uh, and so there are examples for all of you as well. Now, this first example, Blue Ridge Reel, this is what we are calling fully adaptable music. And this is key. Fully adaptable, in my mind, is your solution for connected learning or hybrid. Or if you do go back to school, some of you are at the mercy of scheduling, right? Certain kids at last names, A to G are on Mondays, last names, a, you have no control over instrumentation. So you might go into band one day and you have five flutes. You might go into band the next day and you have two bass clarinets, an alto saxophone and an oboe, right? It's gonna change. The next day you might have trumpets only. It's gonna change every day, but you need music that can work in all those environments. Fully adaptable music will. All right, so if you look at this, you're gonna see, okay, there's a part one, two, three, and four for each instrument. A lot of you, especially on the band side, know this piece, Blue Ridge Reel, all right? 
in addition to this, you'll notice there's an alto clef down there. So for those of you that have mixed band and strings, yes, you can do it with mixed instrumentation, band and orchestra. It works just fine, all right? But in addition to that, you'll notice there are alternate parts, a B flat tenor sax part and a, a horn part. So if the ranges are a little bit out, uncomfortable for those kids that have the regular adaptable parts, we give them alternatives. And then there's additional percussion. Uh, so lots of information on how to use the series. I'll talk to you about that in a little bit, but this is what the score looks like. You'll see that there are three treble clef parts and a bass clef part. If it is a trumpet four part, then obviously that will be a treble clef part adjusted up the octave, all right? So what I want you to understand is that this is not just adaptable by name, but it is practically adaptable. So I uh, got my friend Jose Sibaja, who is the lead trumpet player for Boston Brass, and I asked him um, uh, if, if he would mind recording this for me, which he did. And I want you to hear a little bit of what this sounds like when it's used by just four trumpets and the uh, percussion and piano. It's important to note that all of these pieces have MP3 accompaniments that are available for the kids so that they can play along at any given time, right? So here's what this sounds like with just trumpets. So you get the idea, right? And I could go further into it, but that gives you the idea. Now, a lot of string players are gonna say, yes, I know it's great that it's available for band and orchestra. However, that is in the key of E flat major. And that, what's a good word, is awful. Awful is a good word, right? For a lot of you that are teaching the orchestra world. Well, um, I have actually also done this for orchestra and orchestra alone. And when you look at this, now we're in the key of G major, all right? And not only are we in that key, but I've also done a lot of working around. It's not just transpose, but it actually is more uh, idiomatic for string players. And you'll notice it really works quite well. So you get the idea there as well, okay? Uh, now, Lori had mentioned uh, Champions Rising by Adrian Sims, and that is a regular band piece, right? However, in this situation, we might not be able to do that, right? And so what we've done, notice the grade level on this, and this is going to apply for strings as well. This is a grade one and a half. And because of that, you'll notice under the flexible parts that we are not just including a part one, two, three, and four, it's just a part one, two, and three. Okay, and so what does that mean? Well, when that means is that instead of having four parts, we're now down to three because kids at a younger level, if you only have eight kids in a room and you have four parts, you're guaranteed to have no more than two kids on each part, right? But if you have three parts, then you can put three players on a part. You can do more and it's a little bit more security. Um, now, in this particular case, again, full flexible. So what would this sound like with just trombone choir? One. This is the right one. Now, one of the things that I have not mentioned yet, you'll notice in the piano part, there are chord symbols that are often written, not always, but often. We're anticipating that some of you may wind up with guitar kids in the same class as your orchestra or your band, and they need something to play. So in addition to them just being able to play one of the adaptable lines, they could play chord changes, right? And, and so there's a, some flexibility for them as well. Um, or they could record themselves playing along with the accompaniment track that is available as well. 
Let's look at another option of music that I learned through CRI. And this is more cellular types of music. Frank DeKelly actually inspired me to write this piece. Um, and it's inspired by a lot of you may know uh, Terry Riley's In C, right? And that was a piece that was written in the 60s and it involved purely cellular ideas. Now, this is also available in for, for band and I've changed the key slightly for band, but I wanna show the orchestral version of this for a minute. This is the part and the score. Right, there is no score because this is it. And in this particular situation, what we are allowing the kids to do, and this is really cool. So you see, if you start thinking in a different way, you start to understand that while the situation we are in is not ideal, the things that are going to grow out of this are things that we have never considered doing before that teach music in a whole new way. Consider this for a moment. None of you are band teachers. None of you are string teachers. Not a one of you. What you are, are music teachers. You teach music. You don't teach band. You don't teach strings. You teach music. Band and orchestra happen to be one of many vehicles that we use, but you are not band and orchestra teachers. And I think that's really important to change that paradigm. So what can we teach with a piece like this? Well, first of all, in this particular piece, this is divided into sections. So you'll see all these different sections, right? Section one on two Q, section three on Q. Within these sections, kids can jump around all they want to, right? They all start on, on uh, cell one. Some kids may eventually jump to cell two. Some kids may jump to cell five and then jump back to cell two and foreshadow some of the music that's coming up. Kids get to choose the rate of development in a piece of music. How cool is that? Kids get to choose how quickly or how slowly music develops. Kids get to choose what uh, the energy level of the piece, right? Dynamically, what's it doing? How quickly is it, is it growing or getting smaller? And so the piece sounds different every time. This adds spontaneity. It adds spontaneity to our music that we didn't have before. Go backward to the adaptable music. Kids are going to start suggesting unlikely instrument pairings. Kids are gonna say, hey, why don't we put tuba and flute on line one to be a smart aleck, right? You know they're gonna have those kids that are gonna say that. Let's do that. Or let's put double bass on the line one and violin on part four, because that's gonna be all. And what's going to happen is when some of these kids think it's going to sound awful, some of these combinations are gonna sound really cool. And kids are gonna get excited and they're gonna to wanna to discuss orchestration. They're gonna to wanna to discuss all these different things. So what does it sound like when we take a piece like this, right? And we say, well, we're gonna do something like this. Here's a little bit of this arithmetic number one. idea, right? But there's a lot in there that allows kids to explore and they control the rate of development of a piece. Really, really cool stuff. So now you had meant, I had mentioned to you CRI, right? Well, Frank DeKelly and I were both one of the first people to come up with this fully adaptable music. A lot of you know his four shaker songs, okay? If you are a string teacher, here you go, right? Part one in C treble clef and there's a part one in C bass clef, all right? So there are options for your kids to get involved. What does this sound like? Well, here's some great examples. And so this literally will work for any instrument combination.
So a lot of great ideas, right? Now let's jump over to John Mackey. So John um, was, was like myself, and, and let's be very clear on something. Uh, it's important that we are positive and that we focus on a world of possibility, but at the same time, it's also important to acknowledge our humanity and our struggles. Um, I think if, if our kids feel like every day is a walk in the park and great, then they start to question, maybe something's wrong with me. And I've had awful days. I have days where my triumph is waking up and getting out of bed. Um, and then I have the days of incredible brilliance and creativity. Well, John went through this as well. Um, and, and John didn't write a note. John and I both didn't write a note for several months. Uh, and this was John's first experiment after that. And uh, the funny thing is he really fell in love with the piece he was writing until he thought he was plagiarizing Frank to Kelly. Um, and so he contacted Frank and Frank said, no, I don't think so. And there's where the title came from. He goes, well, I still think I am. So I'll be frank with you. Um, but what I want you guys to hear is th there's a lot of really cool things that can go in here. Now, this piece would fall under what we call semi-adaptable. That D line is required. However, I convinced John and he's going to create an accompaniment file, an MP3, that includes the drum set and the D file. And then any combination of players could play the A, B, and C line. Check this out. Okay, some really cool stuff. Here's a piece by Omar, which uses some improvisatory elements, right? So lots of really cool stuff there as well. Now, very quickly, I want to jump into uh, Alex Shapiro. She has this incredible edge on the electronic side of things, right? So this piece is a piece that has, um, there are game rules that she publishes with it, right? So the rules, you can follow certain rules. and, and, and uh, But this piece could be played by one, two people, or a hundred people, all right? And she creates an incredible uh, accompaniment track that goes along with it. I'll let you hear a little bit of this, but really cool stuff that is very delayed. It includes elements of improvisation. And all of these work brilliantly over the music. This is a perfect piece for virtual learning. Okay, and not only that, but not only is it a perfect piece for virtual learning, but here's a piece by Jennifer Jolly, which can be performed over Zoom. Yes, with lag, it can be performed because the entire piece, and she wrote this well before the pandemic, the entire piece is based on a combination of notes and rhythmic cells that can be performed. It'll sound the same over Zoom as it would live. And so really cool ideas that you can do with some of your advanced kids. Now, let's say that you need your kids to be doing, and I'm almost finished, but let's say that you need your kids to be doing practicing scales, right? Because all of you have scales that you do normally in the beginning of rehearsal. Well, right now you're terrified that your kids are going to lose all their techniques. So here's another resource that has come up, all right? And this is called That's My Jam. And this is a technique book with incredibly fun play along tracks. And I want you to hear like, here's an example of a concert F major. They're in an advanced scale pattern right here. And this is what the kids get to play along with. And we are putting this into smart music. So you get the idea, right? But it's super fun and we're trying to really engage them, all right? We're trying to do the same thing on the performance side of things, right? So some of you in the orchestra world may know the Abandoned Fun House 
Again, only three parts here, but the idea is that the accompaniment track is super fun and it sounds super complete. So that one kid could multi-track themselves using an app like acapella and play the entire piece at home. So you get the idea. What's important for us to realize is that there are a lot of challenges, but there are a ton of solutions, a ton of solutions. And I think the more we start focusing on the solutions and become less worried about the challenges, we start to realize that we are no longer in a world of measurement. If you have not read The Art of Possibility, I suggest you go and find it. But we are no longer in a world of measurement. You change your frame and you discover that you are now in a world of endless possibility. We are now in a world where things are possible now that were not possible when we were in regular rehearsal. You can now be in a room full of kids. And if you want to hear while everybody's practicing, you can have one kid unmute themselves. And in a room of 60 kids, you can focus on the sound of one. That is not possible live. It is not possible live. There are ways to engage these kids in entirely new ways. And I'm hopeful that some of these will not go away. So let's take all this forward as we start to imagine what is possible. And I think with these resources combined with your knowledge, combined with the group community that is creating all this in wonderful connected environments, I think we can start to realize what is possible. All right, cool, I'm done. I went technically a minute and a half over based upon when I started and I take all the blame. <laughs> Um, as well as all the credit for a fantastic presentation. Brian, thank you so much on behalf of Zeswitz and all the educators on the stream today. What a wonderful job. How about a round of a virtual round of applause for Mr. Brian Balmages? What an honor. And that I will put those links into the, um, uh, into the chat w before I forget. Oh, sorry. Say it again, Brian. I said I will put those links in the chat as well. Just Excellent. So, yeah. All right. Well, folks, um, we are still dealing with some power outage internet issues uh, over at Keith Hodgson's house in New Jersey. And again, I hope everybody affected by this hurricane is, is staying as safe as possible. Let me uh, return us to the agenda here. So just to do a quick recap, um, you all heard from uh, Mike and Andy, you heard from Lori Schwartz-Reichel, and now you've heard from Brian Balmages. The next thing that we're going to do is set you up into breakout rooms. Now remember, and as this says on this slide, we have new meeting links for the breakout room. So your breakout room links are in the email that you received from Keith for this from this morning. What's about to happen is that we are going to end this meeting. This meeting is going to conclude and then you will go back to your email and click on the uh, meeting link appropriate for your breakout room. So there's one link for breakout rooms one through eight and another link for breakout rooms uh, nine through 16. Uh, and uh, then at that point, uh, we will be able to add you into your breakouts and, uh, and, and you will be able to uh, continue your discussion questions from yesterday. So in the interest of time and also in, in, in the interest of giving you all a break, we are going to begin the breakout session after Randy. a brief pause. Oh, go ahead, Keith. Randy, I'm sorry. I still don't have power. I'm not able to start the breakout rooms 9 through 16. Uh, I was wondering maybe if we could do this. What do you think about this? What if we tried to do um, some Q&A with Brian since he's still on, if he has the time, um, and then we reconvene tomorrow and just skip the breakout rooms today? Uh, Does that sound like a plan? We could that, we hey, can have a giant a breakout room. I can start right the now. breakout rooms if you want. And Brian, are you are you available for Q and A, Brian? Would you? I I, I am, and 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 um, you know, yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to to do this for a bit. And so, uh, let's just consider this the biggest breakout room ever. 
All right, super. Let's do that. Brian, uh, take it away. Why don't you take uh, uh, mm -hmm. questions from the chat? So folks, if you have questions for Mr. Brian Ballmages, put those yeah, in Yeah, And chat. Randy, I might actually ask you to moderate that if you don't mind. Not a bit. Why don't, um, why don't we do and that? And then gonna... I, will, uh, I will do my best uh, to, to go through some of these. All right, um, super. Let me go ahead and start moderating from the chat. I'm going to scroll up here to see where we'll start. Um, we say a lot, a lot of thank yous to Brian, which is absolutely terrific. Good. I can answer all of those. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're Lots welcome. Of exclamation and, and the what, wait, wait, you're welcome. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, okay. So, uh, Brian, let's start out with how these pieces are available. There's a question here. How many of these pieces discussed will be available on smart music? Um, uh -huh. for the folks using smart music, how might they access them for the folks who may not be using smart music for the fall? How do you recommend that they get access to some of the pieces that you were talking about today? Yeah, absolutely. And I just put the, the social emotional learning thing in there as well. So, <clears throat> all right, let me, let me answer these questions. Um, first of all, uh, a lot of these pieces that I've mentioned to you now, now I cannot speak for all of the CRI composers. I, all I can speak about is for FJH because Obviously, I'm 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 the one responsible for those. Um, I can tell you that we I do have all of those going into Smart Music right now. They're they're aware of them now. The beauty of all those pieces that I've shown you is that a lot of you will say, "Oh, I know that piece," because they're already they already exist, right? And so a lot of these pieces, even if they're not on Smart Music right away in the adaptable version, the full band version is on there, and that can be something that your kids can play along with still right their their music may change but there's an option there now in terms of how they're available um all these pieces uh through fjh we are making available both through print and digital all right and so um if you go to that link fjhmusic.com slash adapt or shop.fjhmusic.com you'll have access to the digital versions which when you when you get them there it becomes a pdf um, people always ask about pricing. Um, when, when, when CRI started, we all kind of decided that um, we, we, we all agreed on two things. And, and, and I want to be very clear on this. We agreed, number one, that we did not want to give anything away. And, and he, let me explain why. Because it, at first you think, oh, geez, they're trying to capitalize on this, right? The reason we do not want to give anything away is because the, 12 comp the 11 composers that I mentioned to you Oh, Julie Giroux, there was, uh, yeah, you ever heard of her? She's on it. Um, and I love her to death. She'll kill me. Um, but um, if the 11 of us started offering materials for free, we would put every other composer in the country through a lot of pain because they wouldn't be able to sell anything, right? And there's so many composers that are trying, like all of us, we're trying to survive. I'm trying to survive, right? I never thought I'd be in a situation where I'm like, gosh, I'm trying to survive, but I, here we are. Um, and so we determined that we did not want to give anything away. However, we also realized that everybody is in a, going to have budget issues, right? So the average of these pieces is going to range somewhere between 45 to $70, I think, on average. is going to be the average price range, I think. Okay. So anyway, they're going to be available digitally. And when you get that, you get the PDF. If you purchase them through print, they're going to come with a sheet that gives you permission to duplicate. All right. So that's already part of it. Um, so that you can duplicate because it's going to be a master set to keep the cost down. You one of each part. Um, so you have that option as well. So you will be able to digitally distribute to your students. The accompaniment that I mentioned to you is going to be on the FJH website. You go to the product page and it's right there. Kids can download it. No charge. It's there. All right. So those are the ways that they can interact with it. So even if you don't have smart music or anything like that, the kids can still download it, throw it into iTunes, or they can throw it in acapella. There's lots of options there. Um, all right, Brian, next question. This is from group 16 and this is kind of, I love group question. 16. Oh, my the, favorite the, best, group. the best, the last, uh, save the best for last group 16. So this is kind of a technical question, but maybe you could make this generalizable to different technology situations. Group 16 asks, how do kids play together? If we are using teams, I assume that means Microsoft teams and have 50 or 60 in one session. It's a great question. And there's a great answer. You got to think outside of the world of measurement. That's the start of it, right? If you want them to play together, technically, are they going to play together? No, but here's how you do it. Look at these fully adaptable pieces, okay? 
for the first time, okay? Why did we do these fully adaptable pieces? Because yes, they are available in books, but those books are like 20 measures long and they're grade two and three pieces. Some of you are teaching high school and you want full length pieces. Check it out. With the fully adaptable model, you can on a Monday rehearsal say to everybody, all right, everybody, today we are going to rehearse part one, have part one available. Your tuba player is looking at part one, your flute player is looking at part one, your bass player is looking at part one, your viola player is looking at part one. Everybody's looking at the same part. And so we say, all right, let's start to, let's start with the first eight measures, all right? And we're gonna play. They're all muted. They're all muted, but you play the first eight measures. All right, who felt like that rhythm was a little bit tricky? Couple kids raised their hand. Okay, great. Who felt really secure with it? Kid raises their hand. Great, unmute yourself and play for the group. They play for the group. All right, great. Did everybody feel like that? Okay, great. Now we're assessing each other, we're talking. Let's talk about the phrase. Where do you hear the phrase peaking? Well, I don't know. Well, I hear it peaking in measure four. Let's all play it again and now peak in measure four. Okay, everybody mute yourselves and here we go. And then you start, ready? And boom, and maybe you don't conduct with them after that point, but now they're all playing. They can see everybody playing together, right? They're seeing each other playing, and then afterwards they're hearing your feedback, and they're all looking at the same thing. You can talk about the dotted quarter note, eighth note rhythm, and have somebody demonstrate that. There are absolutely ways to be in rehearsal all playing together. It's not the traditional way, but we're not in a traditional situation. We've got to expand the way we think. And Randy, you're right. muted. Yep, I'm there muted. You go. There, I got it. Okay, cool. Uh, next question from Ashley LaRose. Could you please expand on any other resources? for teaching beginning strings when kids do not all have instruments at home and are also five years old and don't know how to spell their own name or read music. What do you think of that one, Brian? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's an option, right? Um, I think one great example is, again, thinking outside the box, um, looking at uh, like that rhythm resource that I shared from you at the beginning, count me in. That's a great resource. Um, a, a kid doesn't not need to know how to spell their own name at all, right? You can just go through and, and do that. And, and here's the other thing, really fun things that you can do with that is that in that book, not only are you learning the rhythms, but there are games that Darcy creates. So for example, the games, um, if you think about it, um, I don't necessarily, well, you know what, maybe I will. Um, I'll go back and I'll show you, okay? Because it's, it's really cool. Um, so the games that we're talking about. Um, there are different ways to read this. And by the way, she does go through this with her own kids, but this is really fun. Let me share my screen for one second and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so we talk about ways of engaging anybody, right? Well, look at this, all right? So here we have this lesson one. Well, in addition to just reading through, Darcy will do something where she will have them say, okay, here's the big challenge. Let's do the entire page without stopping, okay? Then she will say, all right, we're gonna do columns. So the kids will read the entire first column, which means the first measure of every line or then they'll do the second measure of every line. She will also notice they say zigzag through the page. She will have her kids go line one, measure one, line two, measure two, line three, measure three, line four, measure four, then line five, measure three. So they're zigzagging through the page. Yes, her beginners will do that and they love it. She will also do something she calls speed band or speed orchestra. She'll put a, a metronome up, right? At mute every kid. And you start your metronome and say, all right, we're going to do speed ensemble today. And you have every kid count through. There's an honor system here. But if they mess up, they are out. All right. And eventually you're up to quarter note equals 192. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right. And they're going through. Right. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, one. Right. And they're going through the whole thing. And every time somebody gets out, they're out. Then it becomes a game and let's see who's gonna, who's gonna be the last one standing. Speed band, speed orchestra. So that's one of many options, right? One of many options that you can use, but it's a very effective one. Um, and so I think, again, yes, we're dealing with, with string players who might not be able to um, 
uh, string players who might not be able to uh, spell their own name yet. And they might not be able to do, but they can still play games. We can still have fun. We can still play music and talk about how it makes us feel, right? Listen to this piece of music. How is it making you all feel right now? Does it make you feel sad? Does it make you feel happy? Does it make you feel lonely? Does it make you feel energetic? Why does it make you feel that way? Well, it just feels really powerful. What's making it powerful? No, it's just loud. Okay, let's talk about dynamics. There are so many ways to engage them. Absolutely. So hopefully that's, that's an example. That is absolutely terrific. Um, all right. Now this next one from group 12, uh, Karen Park from New Jersey. Uh, are there adaptive jazz band pieces as well besides Count Me In, which she says, which sounds amazing. Yeah, the, the, there are, as a matter of fact, it's crazy. But um, if you go onto that website again, which is in the chat, it's fjhmusic.com slash adapt. Uh, Steve Marr posted it to everybody up there. Um, there's a resource um, for fully adaptable jazz music where everybody has all four. And yes, Count Me In is available in print. Um, it is. Um, and so uh, there are full things. Ryan Fraley has done some really cool things where um, the kids can play along with just the combo, right? The, 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 um, the rhythm section and do all kinds of stuff. Um, he's also released a, uh, a new jazz book that's written like a comic book for kids. So there's, there's all these really cool things. You can check it all. I, I won't go into it all here, but it's all available on that, uh, on that page. Um, on that page also is a tuning resource called Tuned, uh, Tuned In. Um, which is sort of a companion to Count Me In, where there are available drones for kids to play along with where they can focus on tuning. Um, so that's something that you can do as well. And the cool thing about that is a drone is something that you can do over Zoom, right? Have somebody drone an open drone. There's no rhythm involved with that. And then have a couple other kids play a note and listen to that intonation, right? And you can talk about that. That is a real rehearsal thing that you can do outside of the constraints of lag and, and rhythm. Terrific. Um, Brian, this one's from Heather Hughes, who writes that she's just getting in after dealing with a flooded basement. And Heather, we, oh boy, we, we feel for you there. Um, I do. How, how do you? I, I do would you let you borrow my coffee you know. mug to bail it out. But there I'm, you go. <laughs> but, I'm, but I love coffee. So sorry. Um, Heather writes, how do you have a metronome sound while playing? What's the best way to help students with a metronome sound while teaching? Um, I, I think there's a lot of, it depends on the, 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 um, the platform that you're using. Uh, if you're using something that allows you to share computer sound, it could be as simple as going into uh, online metronome and sharing uh, the sound from a, a web thing. Uh, it could be quite honestly as simple as having a tuner, in, a metronome in your hand and the microphone is picking that up uh, along with uh, everything else. And I think actually that might be the best way because then you know your voice will be syncing with the metronome because they're both going through the same processor, right? One's not going through a computer and the other one going through the microphone. Um, so I think uh, very easy uh, for, for that to happen, but that's, th those are examples. Terrific. And um, I will mention again, with the, with the accompaniment tracks that I've been mentioning through, this, uh, through the repertoire initiative, uh, the um, reimagine initiative through FJH, all of those do come with a click track uh, ahead of time. So there is a click that gets the kids into it. That's great. Um, and Brian, there's a lot of discussion here about the Facebook group here. So let's just mention that again. That is, that is called the Creative Repertoire Initiative on Facebook. Creative Repertoire Initiative. And, 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 and again, let me be very clear. This is not just representing the 11 composers. There have been dozens and dozens of composers that are putting music up there as soon as it's finished um, and available either self-published or through different publishers. There is no, uh, it's everybody. Okay, um, we're seeing music for strings, we're seeing music for band, we're seeing full flex music, like what I'm talking about, we're seeing semi flex music, which is written in seven or eight parts. So those of you that are, are going back, but are, have instrumentation challenges, but still want to be able to do things in a more traditional flex band setup or flex orchestra, those are coming out too. Um, soon he knew for you orchestra folks, I'm about to release two pieces by her. Um, that are going to be for uh, flexible, fully flexible orchestra. So it can work for any combination of instruments at all um, based on some of her biggest selling pieces and she'll have many more coming as well. Um, and so that creative repertoire uh, initiative is a great Facebook group. Um, uh, you need to apply to get in. Usually it takes about five seconds to get approved because we have somebody who's just like maniacally always on it. Uh, that is absolutely terrific. Um... Well, uh, Brian, another question for you uh, about 
licensing in general for mm -hmm. are those on the call that are thinking about doing any kind of recording or broadcasting of what their students produce this semester coming up and I'll, I'm saying this broadly what's your best advice for how they should should navigate any challenges around licensing um, that they may encounter if they want to rebroadcast any any copyright material yeah um, I know it's a huge this could be a whole the topic of a whole nother call but but can you give us some some sort of top advice in this in this new normal what what does that look like for virtual instruction in particular yeah um step one just 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 pay me money that's the most important step um it doesn't matter what publisher or what composer it can be anybody but pay me money is step one okay and then from there on you're on your own uh no uh in general first of all a lot of uh, publishers are um putting out guidelines for the distribution, digital, digital distribution of their work. And um, it's important to realize that everybody is on the same page here. Everybody wants to do the right thing. Uh, some publishers um, are, are flat out saying purchase includes, you know, this other publishers are saying, look, we're going to do it, but it's going to be a flat fee, a $25 fee, a $50 fee, whatever it might be. Um, but they're moving through very quickly. Um, I think my first recommendation would be to either check the website of the group you're buying from, whether it's the individual composer or the publisher, there may be some pre written things there. It may also be in the music itself. That's possible too. Um, and so check there. Um, if it's not there, uh, there's a pretty easy way to contact most of these publishers and the turnaround right now, to be honest, is very quick. Publishers want, let's face it, publishers want you to play their music. And for some of you right now, the only way to play your music is through some kind of connected virtual presentation. And so publishers are going to support you with that. Right. And so um, there are some licensing things, but there, it, it is not a cost prohibitive thing and publishers are willing to work with you on it. So do not let that be a barrier uh, at, uh, at all. Um, all right, and then we just got a follow-up question on this and, and um, don't let us put you on the spot. So feel free to, to, to punt on this one, but it's a very specific one. Is it okay for us to share parts online with students if we purchase parts? If you are purchasing, okay, so again, I, I can't speak to everybody. Um, every publisher has their own guidelines. Um, uh, we all know that most publishers were granting permission to do that for a while, right? With pre, uh, during the spring. Um, I can tell you right now with the, with the FJH pieces, the Reimagine Initiative, there's an actual piece of paper that comes with it or, or digitally, whatever it might be, that says, you have permission to digitally distribute this music to the students in your group, but your group only. And so it's very specific about what you are allowed to do, but it's very clear uh, what you're allowed to do. And the music is stamped with your school's name on it. And so every kid that has it, it, it shows that it is a legitimate purchase. Um, and, uh, you know, Pepper, I think, has very often said, look, if you're buying, the, if you bought a print version and now you want need e-print, we're giving you permission to do the e-print. It's working. People are working with you. But I can say with, the, with these reimagined initiative pieces, Absolutely. It is. It's flat out uh, there um, with that's my jam that that technique book. Right. Um, we're actually through the uh, shop.fjhmusic.com. We are actually offering digital classroom bundles for that, which are way less expensive than if you were to purchase one print book for every kid in your band. You could do that. But if you're not going to see your kids and you want to be able to just get a digital classroom set, there are three different sizes based upon the size of your band. And you can just purchase a digital classroom set. You download that and that gives you permission to distribute that digitally to all of your students and they will all have access to the digital tracks. So those are just a couple examples uh, of, of what's available. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and there's a note about Pepper. You know, Pepper, Pepper has definitely tried to help connect you know, pizzas that you have bought to ePrint. So if you've been buying from Pepper, so uh, they're trying to make a lot of those now available for ePrint for you without additional purchase or through some kind of deal that they have with publishers. I can't speak really well to that, but I can tell you that, again, publishers want you to have their music in their hands. They're going to work with you. Super. Yeah. And working together really means, you know, for any specific questions, contacting the publisher is probably the, the most definitive way to find out what is and is not allowed, right? Correct. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, when all else fails, contact the publisher. Um, the reality is a lot of these publishers are struggling a lot. I mean, FJH is struggling a lot right now. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, Hal Leonard closed their California office and they are, they're moving some of those employees to um, Colorado. Um, Hal Leonard at one point had furloughed uh, 100, over 100 of their people. Um, FJH has cut back. I mean, just nobody's buying right? Nobody's buying music. And, and so um, I think all of us are trying, just like you guys are trying to re recreate your and reinvent your curriculum, we're trying to reinvent music that can work for your curriculum. Um, and so publishers are, they want to work with you. They want you to know that they are accessible and available. And uh, this is going to have to be a team effort, right? Right now, music education needs all of us working together more than we've ever worked together before in, in, in history of anything. Um, and so it's important to, to keep in mind that we've all got to be on that same page and working together. Amen. Absolutely. Um, all right. Going back for, uh, from a couple minutes ago from Christina, can you talk about the virtual ensembles you created in smart music? I had an account, but I was pretty lost as to how to get started. Yeah. Um, uh, so th there's a couple and I'm working on more things. Okay. I can't talk about them right now because I don't know how quickly the technology can catch up with what I want to do, but the virtual conductor platform was an example where I had a great idea. I got together with the folks at smart music and they figured out a way to align the technology with what I wanted to do. And for those of you not familiar with this virtual conductor platform, um, I saw a problem in the spring where a lot of the honor groups, whether it be band or orchestra that I was supposed to conduct were getting canceled. And teachers were supplementing, as I mentioned, but kids were losing that in-person feeling of, wow, I'm playing under a conductor. I'm playing under a guest artist now and I get to see what they feel in every measure, right? And that was gone. And I didn't want that to be gone. And so I called Smart Music and we worked together and they kept creating new technology. And I said, well, that's really good, but can't you? And they said, I don't know. Well, after a lot of crying and sweat and blood and tears, about three to four weeks later, this virtual conductor platform was born. Now, those of you that have a Smart Music account, great. Those of you that do not have a Smart Music account, not a problem. You do not need a smart music account to even use it. Okay. You need nothing. All you need is a browser. You need Google Chrome. You need Chrome. Okay. So iPads won't work. Safari won't work. You need Chrome to access it. Okay. I will put in the web address for this, um, but it's just www.smartmusic.com slash Brian dash foul mages. All right. And I just put it in there. It didn't create a live link, but there it is. If you access that through Chrome, you will see a list of eight or nine pieces, band and strings, all levels that kids can play along with. And as they're playing, they will see me conducting the piece right in front of them as they're watching the music go by. They can record themselves, but because it's not, it's not, it's so new that it is not part of smart music. So those of you that have a smart music account, if you're trying to access it from within smart music, you will not be able to find it. It is available completely outside right now. Um, we're trying to integrate it over time, but right now you have to find it outside of smart music, but this is a great opportunity for them. If they want to play under my baton, they get to, right? And they can record themselves. Even though, it, the, even though the assessment all is not fully um, operational, it will assess them. Uh, it just, uh, and they can send the recordings to you. Um, so there's a lot in there, okay? Um, and again, for somebody asked me about the website, if you look up just a little bit, you'll see it right there, smartmusic.com slash Brian dash Balmages. It is up there. Um, and uh, from, oh, I, no wonder why, because I only posted it to one person. I'm awful. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. This is why I write music and I don't do like chat stuff. All right. I'm posting it again right now. So anyway, um, that's a little bit of information about that. There you go. Now you can all see it. It's important that you have that dash in there. 
Oh, that's great. Um, and I was just, one of my colleagues just reminded me to mention this, actually the process back to the licensing for a second, the process that, that you just described with reaching out to the publisher is one that one of our clients actually did. And this relates to another question, I think from Christina, you know, if you record a bunch of individual student uh, performances, how do you then stitch those together into a like Brady Bunch style virtual concert? Um, what we did, Brian, was uh, our client reached out to FJH, uh, told them what they wanted to do. It was one of your pieces. It was a, a Star Splitter fanfare. Yep, um, I remember they that. Reached out, they reached out to FJH. They were able to license it for a, a totally nominal fee, um, but they got an actual license to, to, mm -hmm. to reproduce the piece. And it became a virtual concert with, gosh, I think over 300 students in, in Brady Bunch style um, stitching together that they had then uh, were able to share with all their families. And it was the closest thing that they had to a spring concert last, uh, last semester. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much to FJH and, and to you for being so permissive with the licenses and making that, that process that seemed, I think, a little scary at the beginning when they really wanted to do your piece. They really weren't sure if that was going to work, but FJH made it really easy. Um, yeah. And I will mention to you a little trick all right, for a lot of you, um, a lot of you are like, I have no video, video editing skills at all, like none, right? Um, and which I get, I completely get. Um, but a lot of you can record a bunch of your kids and you can throw them all into GarageBand or throw them into whatever digital audio thing. And if you have four clicks and everybody's got the same four clicks, you can all line up those four clicks, right? So here's what you can do. What you can do is sync all of your kids and create an audio track. Then what you can do is put all of those kids together into like a Zoom meeting or Google Meets or whatever platform that you use. You can record that meeting and play the audio and ask the kids to play along. Now it won't be perfectly synced, but you will have a video, the Brady Bunch style video, right? You will have it of all of your kids playing along with that finished product, you can scroll through the screen as they're all playing through it. But talk about saving 30 hours of work and doing that in about 10 minutes. Yes, please, right? So there, there, are, there are little workarounds. And of course, there are now companies that are offering that service as well. And so you can check that out too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we are almost up to the top of the hour, and um, I think I have covered, at least by theme, all of the questions in the group chat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a little wordy and give folks the last chance to get on those keyboards and type something quickly into the group chat. Um, but I wanted to say a huge thank you, Brian, for, for all of your great insights and for everything that you're doing for, for music education. Your, your creativity is a great example and a great inspiration to all of us. As we think about this semester, um, we hope we can approach it as creatively as you, as, as you approach some of your compositions. And in particular, you're being very thoughtful about the way that, that music education is going to be different a little bit in, in the fall season. Um, and, uh, and we are very grateful, not only for you coming on for today, but, but for all the things that you're doing to support classroom music education. So thank you very much. Sure. And as a reminder to all of you, right, it's really important. Number one, yes, I'm being extraordinarily creative right now, but that is not the story of my last three months. Okay. It is not. And so it is okay. I mentioned this earlier. It is okay to acknowledge and accept the fact that things stink, right? And that's important. And I have days that I go through that. Um, acknowledging that has helped me move past it, all right? And not only has it helped me move past it, but um, it also helps me understand the days that I just don't feel creative at all. And I'm just like, fine, I'm just going to go to the pool or I'm going to go do whatever, or I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. And, and that's okay. That's, that's enough today, right? Um, the primary thing that drives me, that I hope will drive all of you, <clears throat> through all of this, I have asked myself two questions. And I invite you to ask yourself the same two questions. Who was I when this started? Like, who was I when, when virtual hit the ground and I got kicked out of my school. Was I um, focused entirely on 
the concert? Was I focused entirely on the adjudication? Was I focused entirely on competition? Was I burning out? Because all I was doing was running every day and all day. I was in rehearsals before school, after school. Was I lacking balance? Was I, did, did I really not even know who my family was? Ask yourself those hard questions and, and ask them. And then the second question is, who do I want to be when this is over? Who do I want to be when this is completely over? Where can I become a better version of myself? And I ask myself that every single day. And right now, understand, this: there is a gift that has been given to all of us that most of us have not had in decades. It is the gift of time. We have not had it. And suddenly, we are dropped with this gift of time right in our lap. So what do we do with it? Well, we use it as a time to reevaluate who we are, why we teach music, and we move beyond knowing that music is not always about performance. And a matter of fact, we can all agree that the performance is not the part that we really fall in love with. It's the road to that. It's the relationships that are developed along that way. That won't change. The only thing that's changing is the performance element. And some of you will get around that too, that in-person element, but we have solved that in this session. So there are ways forward and there are gifts that we have been given. Let's not squander them. Brian, that is wonderful. Bravo. On behalf of everybody on the call, on behalf of Zeslitz Music and, and everybody, just thank you so much for the such such wonderful, inspiring words. Well, well done. Absolutely. Right. Thank you all so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Ballmages. Um, all right. Well, folks, that, uh, that concludes today's session. Thank you for your patience as we dealt with hurricanes and, and power outages and, and internet issues and all those sorts of things. Tomorrow resumes, uh, you know, uh, come hell or high water. Tomorrow resumes uh, day three of the workshop. And we're looking forward to Michael Levine, Scott Sheehan, and Sarah Goulish, as well as for sure this time, an opportunity for, for more work in the breakout groups. Um, so please join us again tomorrow at the same time uh, with those same Zoom links uh, for more great work uh, towards planning for the fall, being ready for anything, and reimagining instrumental music. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.